In our program, we have four subject matter experts. Robert George, the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program, Princeton University. The Emancipation Proclamation uh, did not run in those states that were loyal to the Union, that had not seceded, and that included some slave states up around the border like Maryland and uh, Kentucky. Michael Segru, Research Fellow, the James Madison Program, Princeton University. It's short and it's direct, and he says that the blood of these men that have died at Gettysburg um, is testimony to how fully Americans have bought into a certain conception of what America is. Clarence Walker, Professor of History, University of California, Davis. The 14th Amendment overturns the Dred Scott decision because it, by declaring black citizens of the United States, it creates now a new United States. It creates a biracial state, whereas before the United States had been a white state. Priscilla Zotti, Associate Professor of Political Science, the United States Naval Academy, Annapolis, Maryland. The 14th Amendment is um, today the most litigated part of the Constitution. It contains three clauses, uh, the Due Process Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, and the Privileges and Immunities Clause. The Homestead Act, the Pacific Railway Act, and the Morrill Act, 1862. Once the southern states seceded from the Union, the northern states began passing a number of measures which the South had blocked prior to 1860. Among these were the Homestead Act, the Pacific Railway Act, and the Morrill Act. But first, some background. The winter of 1860 saw Abraham Lincoln elected as our 16th President of the United States. He took the oath of office and delivered his inaugural address March 4, 1861. In that address, he had a warning for the South. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. Just weeks later, the southern states began to secede from the Union. War came in April of 1861. While the Civil War raged on many battlefields along the eastern seaboard, the business of the nation continued. Congress, seeing an opportunity to pass legislation southern states would not have supported, passed three important acts. One was the Homestead Act. This had always been uh, something that the southern slave-owning slave interests had feared because a nation, a, a nation of yeoman farmers would impede the extension of slavery and, and slave plantations into the very valuable agricultural land in the middle of the United States. It permitted any citizen to receive 160 acres of public land and then to purchase it for a nominal price after living on it for five years. The political moment was, was right to make possible the uh, obtaining of homesteads by white families that would settle them and establish yeoman farmer societies, which would be very hostile towards the introduction and extension of slavery. Another act passed in 1862 was the Pacific Railway Act. One of the questions constantly before Congress in the 19th century was internal improvements, mainly improvement of the country's transportation system. A yet unfulfilled dream was to have a transcontinental railroad and telegraph line that continued the country's transportation and communication system from the Missouri River to California. This act paved the way. Well, giving away other people's land 
is actually a fairly easy thing to do. In other words, since there are very few American citizens there and their land titles are very sketchy, um, it's, fairly, it's relatively easy for the federal government to decide that they would just move the Indians out of the way and uh, acquire the land by a claim of eminent domain. The railroads employed many immigrants to do the very difficult manual labor. The Central Pacific employed more than 10,000 Chinese workers. The work was backbreaking and took six years to complete. Finally, in 1869, in a ceremony at Promontory, Utah, just north of Salt Lake City, the last rails were laid and a golden spike was driven in the completed track. By the time the rail lines were completed, Congress had granted 174 million acres of public land for railroad rights of way. The third important act passed in 1862 was the Morrill Act, named for the Vermont congressman Justin Morrill, who introduced the measure. This law made it possible for the new western states to establish colleges for their citizens. Most of higher education was seen as very elite, very Ivy League-ish, and it really brings education to anyone. It becomes very affordable and allowable for many Americans to go uh, to a higher university. Ever since colonial times, a good education has been a central theme in American democratic ideals. The colonization process included the establishment of some of our oldest colleges, Harvard in 1636, William and Mary in 1693, and Yale in 1701. In the state of Texas, where I'm from, land-grant colleges have been the great equalizer. And even today, the number of students that are first-generation college that go to these large land-grant institutions and the tuition is low and the, the level of instruction is high, they're wonderful. And, and they've made such a difference in allowing people to get an affordable college education. The Emancipation Proclamation. 1863. Prior to signing the Emancipation Proclamation, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law legislation that, in July of 1862, authorized African American slaves to serve in the military of the Union States. This was a stepping stone to the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, there's a question about whether Lincoln was operating within his constitutional authority in freeing the slaves in the rebellious states with the Emancipation Proclamation. The argument against Lincoln is straightforward. Nowhere in the Constitution is the president, or indeed the entire federal government, given any authority to abolish slavery. There's no delegated power that would permit the national government to interfere with slavery in the states that wish to have it. Lincoln realized he did not have the constitutional authority to free the slaves. So where did he look for this constitutional authority? He claimed the constitutional authority to issue the Emancipation Proclamation under his war powers. He said that this was an act that was uh, required in wartime to disable an enemy that was waging war against the United States. And that was the justification. Lincoln does not end slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation. It, it frees very few slaves. It allows those in, in territories of the national government to uh, allow them to fight freely in the Union forces if they desire. So its impact is, is minimal at the time, but I think its message is, is what's important about it, that it, it sends the message that there is an equity issue here that will eventually be resolved. And I think Lincoln's sense of fairness that blacks should be treated the same as whites uh, is the view that prevails. And I think that's why it's such a significant document. He began to make it clear in the first inaugural address what he was prepared to fight for. And by the time of the Gettysburg Address, he really had, I think, made it clear what he was fighting for was fighting not simply to preserve the Union. He saw more at stake than that. The original position of Abraham Lincoln on the Civil War was that it was a war to preserve the Union and not destroy slavery. 
that if Lincoln could have brought the southern states back without disestablishing slavery, he would have. It's only over a course of three years of hard struggle that emancipation becomes the central focus of northern military concerns and concerns of the Union. He saw in the United States the one hope for mankind of establishing the principle of Republican government, what he would call in the Gettysburg Address, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Lincoln needed some impressive Union victories over the Confederacy first before issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Otherwise, the proclamation would have looked like an act of desperation. The first of two impressive victories for the Union came at the Battle of Shiloh, April of 1862. Led by General Ulysses S. Grant, the Union forces defeated the Confederate troops with both sides suffering tremendous losses. The Union suffered 10,000 casualties. The Confederate side suffered 13,000 casualties. The second victory for the North came at Antietam in Maryland, September of 1862. Again, casualties were heavy. In fact, it was the bloodiest single-day battle in United States military history. The Confederates suffered 13,000 casualties, the Union 12,000. The battle stopped a major Confederate offensive led by General Robert E. Lee, and it raised hopes for victory in the North. Lincoln now had his opportunity to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation actually argued, you know, had the effect in the South that if blacks in southern states escaped or uh, found some way to, to leave and, and, or were released by their owners so that they could be uh, free men, it, it economically it did impact the South because it, it, it forced uh, southern uh, cotton owners, for example, to, to have to find other labor sources, which traditionally meant white men who then aren't fighting uh, the North in the Civil War. The operative words of the document are these. All persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforth and forever free. Had the war ended, had there been uh, a truce, uh, had Lincoln lived, what would the status of the Emancipation Proclamation have been? The proclamation says that in those states in rebellion, the slaves are free not just for the duration of the war, but forever. But how can that be constitutionally permissible? Once the war has ended, obviously there's no military need to continue the abolition of slavery. So wouldn't slavery have come back constitutionally? Wouldn't some people perhaps have been re returned to a status of, uh, of slavery. Of course, in the end, tragically, President Lincoln was uh, assassinated uh, and the matter was uh, handled by way of constitutional amendment. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolishes slavery throughout the United States. The Gettysburg Address, 1863. The Civil War raged on in 1863. Confederate General Robert E. Lee took the battle to northern soil when he led 75,000 troops into Pennsylvania. It was at Gettysburg that he clashed with two Union brigades led by General George Meade. Three days of fighting left a total of 43,000 young American men dead. One of the things that we have to understand about the Gettysburg Address is that it was delivered in circumstances of great sadness. President Lincoln had gone to Gettysburg, the site of an epic battle in which many, many lives on both sides had been lost, to dedicate a cemetery and to say something to the widows and uh, children of those soldiers who had lost their lives and to explain the cause of that sacrifice and the justification for the war. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, 
and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal.